Parts of Australia have been dealing with a heat wave over the holiday weekend as we close what's expected to be the hottest year in recorded history. Sydney siders could celebrate Christmas at the beach, as they often do, but much of the East Coast is under flood alerts. More than 20 bushfires have been burning in Western Australia. Meantime, temperatures in Beijing are slowly climbing after dropping to below freezing nearly two weeks ago. China's capital saw its longest cold, cold wave since record keeping began in 1951. Climate analyst Elliot Jacobson joins us now. He's a retired professor of mathematics and computer science. Good to see you. Welcome back. Well, thanks so much for having me back. OK, well, here's a sample of what Christmas Day was like across much of the Northern Hemisphere. From Minnesota South Tribune, rain and record warmth on Christmas Day. Over in the UK, The Guardian reports, white Christmas declared as Scotland sees snow, but elsewhere it's 12 degrees Celsius. And from Chicago Sun-Times, Families open presents and rush outdoors on an unseasonably warm Christmas day. What seems odd here in some respects is how these climate events are described as, you know, unseasonably warm, treated almost as some kind of anomaly, because, you know, it'll all get back to normal at some point, is the thinking, I guess. But if you look at the numbers, which is what you do, and you do the math, the average temperatures are not coming down anytime soon. Well, they certainly aren't. In fact, the last four months has been about 1.7 degrees Celsius uh, above the pre-industrial baseline, and that's for the entire world. And, you know, the Paris limit is 1.5 Celsius. So we've been cruising above the Paris limit for the last four months. And don't be mistaken, that doesn't mean we've officially broken the Paris limit, because that has everything to do with sort of the long-term average. But it has just been blistering these last four months. And I think we're just seeing the effects of that now. So as someone who was a consultant to the computer industry, using your mathematics skills to look at risk uh, and, you know, and anomalies, that kind of stuff, what would, using those skills, looking at the data which is already out there available on the climate, where are we heading and where do you think we are right now? Well, we keep on seeing events that are just off the scale in terms of any sort of normal assessment of risk. So when we talk about how often things occur, for example, right now, world sea surface temperatures are about a 1 in 17 million shot. But that kind of thing is happening every single day. So we can no longer talk in sort of the classical way about the probability of events anymore or, or the risk of things happening anymore because we are entering a new system. And unfortunately, that new system isn't even stable. It keeps on accelerating to even new, uh, newer and newer highs. So in terms of risk modeling, I can say that we are way out on the tail end of anything that was ever expected. But that's now our new normal. Yeah. Well, now here's a brief message from Britain's King Charles. Listen to this. We care for the earth for the sake of our children's children. During my lifetime, I've been so pleased to see a growing awareness of how we must protect the earth and our natural world as the one home which we all share. Awareness is important, and it is a good thing that people are now more aware of what's going on. The problem, it seems, is the disconnect between you know, the awareness and the doing part. We know what needs to be done. We just haven't been doing it. Well, that's right. I mean, if you think about what needs to be done, that's what we attempted to get that language into COP28, namely phasing out fossil fuels. And the language that actually went in was transitioning away from fossil fuels, which is essentially just, just uh, it has no real depth to it or meat to it at all. So, yeah, the... There is sort of a, an understood pathway, but there's another sense in which, well, we already missed that off ramp. Yeah. We are, it's already too late for that. So, yeah, it's nice to talk about what we could do if doing that started 20 years ago. And that's kind of how I hear that statement. Uh, it, you know, we are in the, the festive season, so we'd like to end on a positive note. Uh, CNN reporting five reasons to be hopeful. Um, after the, a bad year of climate news, as those dark, ominous climate change clouds roll in. This year has seen a surge in renewable energy, also a climate deal that targets fossil fuels, but in a very sort of nefarious way. Uh, plummeting deforestation in Brazil. The ozone layer is healing well, and electric vehicle sales have surged. Uh, yeah, the big group also made a comeback in 2023. But 
are any of these positive developments in terms of you know energy renew renewable energy and uh, satellite of EV cars? Are any of them in and of themselves a game changer at this point? Well, none of them are, but I'd like to add one to that, that we are starting to see actual declines in the rate of growth of methane. And that was, you know, in the Glasgow uh, Compact, that was the big one. Could we get to um, a 30 percent reduction by 2030? And I've run the numbers on that. We're going to get there by about 2032, 2033. So we're not that far behind. So the good news that actually is very meaningful, if you need good news, and, and we all do, is what we've managed to do curbing methane. Um, these other things, it's, you know, I, I looked down that list myself, and it's not very impressive because we need teeth, right? We need, mm -hmm. we need civilization changing teeth going on right here to really make a difference. And although these sort of small ways of patting ourselves on the back are not going to get us there. Yeah, it, and that is a, a, a salient point to finish on. Um, Alan, thanks for being with us. Alex Jacobson, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you.